Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the edition numbered 696. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 29th, 2021. All right, welcome to the beginning of an episode. This is where I dash my eyes to the left to make sure the, the audios are bouncing back and forth in George and I have the same audio. I, I make a double check that George is not slouched, that I'm not way too high for the camera. And I, I'm just doing my last minute checks here as we get into our broadcast for Friday here. Lots of news we got to cover. Before we get too far, please like this episode, share this episode, Go to the comment section, which many of you did last week. We appreciate that very much. And tell us your opinions about the topics we talk about. If you had not subscribed yet, please click that subscribe button. You will get an instant notification every time there's a new episode. And we try and do this twice a week. And if all else fails and you just don't want to watch us, you can listen to us. Go to the show notes on YouTube and you will find a link to our podcast. George, how are you doing this week? Oh, it's a wonderful day, Kevin. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, sunny, no humidity. The breeze is uh, blowing. I've only shut the windows because I don't want the background noise. But, oh, God, God bless me for I've been a wonderful church and a wonderful place and a wonderful time of life. Well, your church is actually kind of close to the highway there. They go, that big hill that goes up and over into the canto. So, yes, there's highway noise. Here, I close the windows so people would not hear the little golf carts puttering back and forth that we have here in webster i i our our summer trip is over as you people know we left here spring summer and fall we are now back to florida i'm in my little uh, retirement rv community where uh, everybody has an rv like i do and they go back and forth here on the road and they don't go for walks they take their golf golf <laughs> golf carts out for a walk and they take their little dogs out for a walk walking them next to the golf cart it's the cutest thing you've ever seen george so what well, i will make one slight correction kevin hmm? we are actually about 45 miles from the nearest interstate highway you we are, are yeah. in we our highway here is actually one of the few four-lane roads that hmm. we have uh we're we're on the main strip here because you know we have four stoplights in my town Ooh. And but we have but do you know the exciting big news? It mm -hmm. actually was in the paper several times now. They're building a Culver's. Get now, out! The, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I mean, I've been to the first Culver's in Sulk City, Wisconsin. So it's kind of cool that we see that uh, the uh, uh, the franchise growing as we speak. So well, maybe kidding. all the people from Salt City have moved down in their retirement years to Florida, and they want a familiar face to yeah, greet. Frozen custard. In fact, truth be told, we hit Culver's last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough, enough about George and I. Let's talk about the news. Got lots of stories here. Uh, quickly, um, episode seven hundred is coming up. If you have any ideas. Uh, about what we should do for episode uh, 700. We did something fun for 500 where we had you guys send us some videos. If you have some ideas for 700, um, no, Pat Robertson's not coming out of retirement to be with us for an episode of uh, uh, Unscripted, but uh, you put any ideas you have in the comment section. We'd like to, to hear from you. Um, I got good news story. Ask George. I'm afraid. George, what's the good news story? This is my fun story of the week. One of the people Kevin and I have known for many years, and I think almost all of our readers who follow religion in the press, secular press, will know the name of Terry Mattingly. Terry's now retired, but he still has a syndicated column. He's been a columnist, a university professor, and uh, it's got internet websites uh, that look at journalism. I worked for him for several years on mm -hmm. the Get Religion website. Well, Terry has a weekly column that's syndicated across hundreds of newspapers in the U.S. And he t took up a Michael Nazar Ali story for his last article. Now, Terry's a pro. He knows how to craft a new story, not just a quick scan the headlines, write out 300 words and you're done, but a really well thought through column. 
And so Terry lays out the facts of Michael Nazarello's story, looks at what does it mean in the big picture, and then introduces the talking heads about two thirds, three quarters of the way down. Now the art of a good writer is allowing each talking head to speak and, be, and, and have that person read what they say and said, yeah, that's what I said. But where the craft comes is when you sort of position them or choose the words that make one side look so much better than the other. And so here's Kevin Coulson cited as the Anglican talking head against Al somebody as the other side. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait, where is this? What? I'm <laughs> looking it up. <laughs> I didn't know this. Keep talking, keep talking. No, oh my goodness. Kevin, you should uh, you should have G G G Jill uh, Google your name every yeah, so I often. I just did. Check didn't for porn uh, okay. uh, well, Oh, there okay. it is. On religion. Okay, cool. And, and Kevin is the one who gets to say, well, the Anglican Church has its problems right now, as has the Catholic Church's throughout history. But, you know, in God's time, we'll see this all worked out. And so Kevin is the voice of reason, calmness, wisdom, the avuncular fellow who has his thumb on the pulse of Anglicanism against the sort of Catholic polemicist guy whose underpants are a little too tight, who's breathing too fast. So Terry Mattingly, thank you for this gift of adding one of the wise men to this show <laughs> giving I, kevin colson a big gold star i just googled my name and here here's the quote and it must be from last week's episode roman catholicism has seen its better day and we pray that it will see a uh, uh, this, see it better again wow what a great quote i don't yeah, know how the that's the voice of reason <laughs> no no it's it's it, but it comes because you're saying something against your interest. Sure, you're I mean, the Anglican both, yeah. talking head, and, but you're saying something that makes the other side, you wish them success. And couldn't, okay. could, couldn't it written it better myself if I wanted to have some PR for the show? I really. Uh, cool. <laughs> how, let me ask a question. How much did this cost you? Yeah, boy. I, or how was it going to cost me? It, you know, Terry Mandeley, uh, you know, I've known him for the long time. You and I have been reading his stuff for 20 or 30 years. Uh, certainly very influential in the religious community. Uh, thank you for adding me to this story. It's it's great to see uh, a little bit of a, um acknowledgement for the, the work of Anglican TV. So cool. Just uh, think of how he no could more have written it. No, no more surprise good stories for George, though. <laughs> well, just think of how he could have written He could have started off Florida man, Kevin Coulson. <laughs> That's right. And then... <laughs> <laughs> They're very good stories to the Florida man. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, my. That's hilarious. All right. Well, thank you, Terry, for uh, uh, bringing notoriety to the show. We appreciate that very much. Um, so now, ironically, I was going to talk about a link that I found on Forbes to an Anglican.ing story. Um, our Iceland story got linked to by Forbes. That's weird. My old professor, years ago, I earned an MBA degree and uh, the old professors who thought I'd never would amount to anything in the business world will finally see my name in print in Forbes. My grandfather alive, he would be proud of me. Forbes magazine has a section called Forbes Best where they have uh, sort of the business equivalent of news of the world or news of the weird and they link to our story on the Church of Iceland pre-strike. Well, friends, if you haven't been following Icelandic news on Anglican Inc., here's what's happening. A little background. The Church of Iceland is a state Lutheran church. Its clergy are employees of the state, and they have a contract negotiated by their union with the government about their how much they are paid and what they perform, and part of the contract includes allowing them to earn fees for baptisms, weddings, funerals. Well, the Executive Council, the bishop and the, her cohorts of the Church of Iceland said, we're going to stop that because we don't want people to be turned away from the church because they have to pay money to get their child baptized. So we're no longer going to allow priests to collect fees. Well, that caused the clergy association to say, it's in our contract. If you terminate the contract, 
we may have to take industrial action. Industrial, is that like holding up the normal race sign, union? <laughs> strike, strike. No justice, no peace. Uh, and so there's a strike threat for the Church of Iceland. Now, they may want to wait till at least Christmas Eve before they have uh, the picket lines go out. So it's a fun little story, and I got to play with posting Church of Iceland officials' fee schedules and things that just shows how little little odd I can be. But Forbes linked to this as a labor news story, and Anglican Inc. just, uh, its clicks shot through the, through the roof the other day. Oh, obviously, Forbes was having a slow week, couldn't find good labor news. Terry was having a slow week that, uh, I'll get a quote from Kevin, that'll be fun. So, we, we, slow news weeks have really benefited Anglican Dead Inc. And we, we do appreciate the, the links from both Forbes and Terry. Wow. The, the last the last time it was this good was, do you remember when Drudge linked to us oh, a few sure. years, seven, right. eight years ago, when Al Gore started a green fund and the Church of England was one of its first investors? <laughs> into Al Gore's fund and Drudge picked that up and I think it was like G December 30th or 31st when nothing is happening and I think it shut down the server or something close to it it just was it was a busy day you busy know day. My, my servers are Drudge proof and that's actually a term in the in the in the, in the IT world is your is your server Drudge proof yeah 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 you can link here no problem <laughs> no, so, <don't. laughs> so you know it's uh, I just it's too bad Drudge has uh, gone, faded away, but uh, mm -hmm. man, oh, thank you, Forbes. Thank you, Church of Iceland. Thank you, <laughs> Terry Mattingly. That's right. Well, I mean, and that's a good point. Drudge is no longer unique uh, like he used to be. It used to be a place you went for not just conservative news, um, which he had links to many different stories, but he wasn't afraid to link to the obscure story that was interesting mm -hmm. he he found the interesting news stories and now you go there and it's like well i'm on cnn mm -hmm. <laughs> dot com or i'm on abcnews.com it's, it's not as unique as it used to be and that's too bad because that made him a lot of money back in the day uh money we could use but all right so let's see here let's move on to real news real stories george um we got a press release from GAFCON Australia that they are upset, concerned, and a bit miffed that Bishop Michael Nazarelli, no longer bishop, has moved from the Anglican uh, Church of England to the Roman Catholic Church, which we op uh, opined on uh, at least for three weeks here on Unscripted. And they said nice things in a nice way that we didn't see from uh, the... Uh, Archbishop of Nigeria, George. <laughs> well, they said essentially the same thing. They did. But the Church of Nigeria said it in a Nigerian way for Nigerian mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. And GAFCON Australia said it uh, in a polite way for a Western audience. But they both, both were saying the same thing. That Michael Nazarelli, nice fella, made a terrible mistake that endangers his immortal soul. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. For, for all intents and purposes, what are you doing? You know? Oh, my, but this is minute 14 in the 15 minutes of fame of this story. I think it's the last ripple on the pond from when we tossed in the, from when Michael Nazarelli tossed in the stone of the mm -hmm. conversion story. It, we've had the Catholic euphoria, the sort of the Catholic polemicist press has had its articles. The Catholic liberal press has not really made much of this because they don't know what to do with this story because they don't see why this is good for them because uh, it's not uh, no, th we, this is this is the type of story that shows up on church militant websites this is the, the, the type of story that um, and is this the Gavin story is this another bishop like Gavin oh Gavin was really clear about his reasons for joining the Roman Catholic Church he had all these great statements of he was going to the Roman Catholic Church because he found something in the Roman Catholic Church and he could cite that doctrine or that belief or you know, he could cite why he was going to the Roman Catholic Church. Unlike Michael Nazarelli, who in every interview, why did you join the Roman Catholic Church? Why are you joining us, Michael? Um, I don't like uh, the Church of England. That's great, that's great. Okay, Michael Nazarelli, you, 
obviously you've been you've been seduced to come over to the Roman Catholic Church. There's got to be something, one iota of something you like about the Roman Catholic Church. What is it? Um, I, I, I don't like the Church of England. That's his answer. <laughs> yeah, he, the National Catholic Register ran a interview with Michael Nazarelli, and he gives very thoughtful reasons what's wrong with the Church of England, none of which I disagree with. Nope. Uh, but he doesn't say that I am persuaded that all the things that I believed that were distinctive marks of the Church of England and the Protestantism and the Anglican way were false. Huh? The Marian doctrines, uh, all my support over the years for the ordination of women, I was mistaken. He doesn't say any of that stuff. Just rather, uh, I would rather be on the winning team instead of the losing team, and I perceive the losing team to be the Church of England. Yeah. The Anglican way at this time. So, it, but, as I said, I think this story is reaching its natural end. It, and it has, because after three or four weeks here, in reading this, we find that there's no there there. Mm. You know, there's no, you know, compelling story of reaching into the Roman Catholicism way of life. It's rather, it's like jumping out of a burning building, hoping that the ground don't kill you. You know, so that's... I hate to say it that way, but that's the way the interviews are coming off. And you're right. This is min this is minute 14 and 15. It's a fading story. Uh, now we need to talk about some tough news. Um, the tough news on my list here is Sudan. Uh, Sudan recently had a military coup. The military took over um, what is, I guess you'd say, North Sudan. Um, and it's going to be really rough. There's going to be a lot of persecution. And the coup's biggest fear, and I hate to see this, is that uh, they will kick out the existing power there and democracy will be replaced. The way you fight democracy is you be more violent. You be more uh, uh, bloody. And that's going to really hurt the remaining Christians in Sudan, George. Monday, the army uh, took to the streets overthrew the transitional government. Transitional government came in power a few years ago after the nation kicked out its Islamist dictator, uh, Omar al-Bashir. Bashir is the one responsible for all the massacres in Darfur, of all the massacres uh, in the, the Duba Mountains, and for the protracted war in South Sudan. He was kicked out. Now, his supporters have seized power back transitional government is out of power. The transitional government uh, allowed for freedom of religion. It allowed Christians to hold property uh, without fear of confiscation of the government. On paper, it was, mo and there were Christians brought into the government, women brought mm -hmm. into the government, Dem uh, moderates brought into the government. That's all gone. The army's back in charge. And there's a, tr and what's been happening? Well, the COVID crisis has been particularly tough for Sudan. The economy has tanked this last year or so. And according to sources on the ground, uh, money from uh, the Gulf and Saudi Arabia has been going in to support the Islamists. And their discontent with the way things were reached the point where the army said, we have to step in to restore uh, tranquility and peace and straighten things out problem is this is the same group that was persecuting the Christians in the Nuba Mountains South, par, portions of when South Sudan left North le, left Sudan it took the vast majority of Christians in the country one region that was held on to by Sudan was the Nuba Mountains mm -hmm. and the lowlands around it that's where the oil is they didn't want to lose control of that because that pays for the government of Sudan and the Christians in the Nuba Mountains have been the victims of an ongoing genocide that stopped under the transitional government, but their fears it's going to start up again. Their fear, see, Su Sudan has Muslims who are Arabs and Africans. And the massacres in Darfur with Arabs, Muslims, massacring the black Muslims. The Nuba Mountains are the Arab and some black Muslims massacring the black Christians. And 
so there's issues of race, there's issues of religion, there's issues of foreign interference, and the church, the Christian church, needs your prayers in Sudan because this is this is real persecution. This is where you will be killed for your faith in Jesus Christ. You will lose your livelihood. You will be singled out and made an example of. Um, it's not the persecution that we talk about in the West of, that people are so quick to uh, claim victim status for. No, it's a, well, you look at the, the lust in Sudan and Nigeria and other places for fossil fuel, uh, to quickly switch into South Africa, the church down there has spoken about fossil fuel in a different way, George. Uh, the greeny weenies are in charge of the Church of South Africa, it seems. The, some of the biggest oil fields, untapped oil and natural gas fields, are under northern Mozambique and out into the Indian Ocean. And there is the potential to make one of the poorest countries in the earth finally have a taste of development. Oil exploration brings roads, it brings electrification, it brings sewer lines, which also generate income, which builds schools, which builds irrigation systems. Capitalism raises the standard of living, energy resources, having working electricity that works continuously, uh, raises the standard of living, the standard of health. All of that comes from mineral exploitation and modern mineral extraction exploitation does not have to equate with the old image of the ruined and ravaged landscape of strip mining. But the South African House of Bishops has issued a statement saying we demand an immediate stop to oil, all oil and gas exploration in Africa, which the consequence will be that the poor will remain poor, the rich will get richer off of the poor, and nothing will improve for the livelihood of people in that continent. Yeah, I mean, South Africa, uh, for whatever reason, uh, its leadership uh, does not understand basic economics. And I don't want to give a big lecture here on capitalism, but in the history of mankind, capitalism has helped out more poor people than any other economic system, communism, socialism, totalitarianism. It's not perfect. Oh, it's so far from perfect, George. But any well-reasoned look at world history will show you that having a, a government that supports businesses is a government that supports its poorest people. Yeah, so... But this is not a time for Kevin's uh, ca capitalism rant. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Well, actually, it's you right. know, but let, let me do George's uh, rant instead. Sure. Okay, yeah. you know, we're, in a, we're in a period of material scarcity and shortages of some basic raw materials. We we'll read about the uh, aluminum production. Car production is going to be hurt in the United States because they can't get aluminum, because Alcoa and other aluminum producers can't get magnesium, which is a necessary mineral to stiffen raw aluminum, because raw aluminum bends, it's not very strong, but you need magnesium mm -hmm. to make it uh, into uh, uh, aluminum metal. as we use yeah. it, yeah. you can. Mm -hmm. The Chinese uh, are cutting back because they have all these electrical blackouts, so there's a shortage. Magnesium, raw earth metals, oil, gas, copper, tin, zinc, all these things are underneath Mozambique and are a treasure trove that if exploited properly and cleanly um, would lift that country out of poverty. Hmm. But that's not what the church bishops want. No, in fact, you look at a place like Alaska, uh, which uses its oil exploration and oil production to give money to its citizens. Every citizen of the state of Alaska gets a stipend check once a year from the, sta the state. Because you live, you're live, you an Alaskan and we are selling the oil from Alaska, you get, I forget how many thousands of dollars each citizen gets, but here's your money. I have a friend from high school that lives in Alaska and he gets his little check. This is, this is what it means to live in Alaska. You, you get paid to live here because they sell the resources. And that could be something that happens in South Africa as well where you can uh, lift people out of impoverty, uh, 
the impoverished environment they are by using the natural resources around you. That's the one, of the difficult, one of the difficulties, and especially in South Africa, mm -hmm. is this rosy picture of capital and economic development depends upon a Christian worldview and mindset mm -hmm. because it depends on clean government. South Africa is plagued by corruption corruption by the ruling African National Congress Party. Um, in almost every walk of life where the state is involved, from electricity generation to the defense industry to the police services, there is marked corruption, which is destroying the economic base of that country. A few people are getting richer and richer and richer, but the poor are getting poorer and poorer because there's no good government. There's no safety and property rights. Um, you're a farmer. Uh, you, let's say you're a white commercial farmer. Are you going to invest uh, in new equipment? Are you going to basically make the investments to make your farm more productive, to produce more per acre? If at any moment the radicals in the ANC party get their way and they'll take your farm away, uh, just like what happened in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. We saw the commercial sector promote, promote almost all the income exporting from that country and Zimbabwe was one of the bread baskets of Africa, and now it's plagued once again by starvation and famine. Well, South Africa is plagued by the riots they had this summer. I mean, <laughs> one of the problems is it's not a stable government, um, and it's not a stable government because of how they treat the different classes within their society, because of the corruption they've had, because of the long history in uh, dealing with uh, certainly some race issues uh, 30 years ago. Um, it's it, and the, it has and not recovered from that, you know. And the corruption issue has uh, leaked into the South African church in some places. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you remember we did some stories a few years ago about the Bishop of Umtada? Uh, Umtada is in the Eastern Cape, and the uh, South African bishops were going to do an audit because the bishop had been accused of ghost employees of. Uh, keeping the salaries for his priests, of hiring his own relatives. And before the day before the auditors came, oh, the cathedral burned down with all the records. Oh, isn't that a shame? Oh, it's terrible. Um, I don't want to pick on any one bishop, but corruption is a problem in some parts of the South African church among the uh, Episcopate. Mm -hmm. Good old Indian style corruption. Maybe we could change, maybe you'll let me do more stories about India if I can. We, well, we, we, to Africa. I think it's time to hire an Indian correspondent, George, and an African correspondent. Uh, we, we should come up with a plan for that in the future. Um, but he, he, hear me likely because I don't yeah. want to open a door to be for us to be attacked. Mm -hmm. We're not saying this is an African problem. We're saying mm -hmm. this is a human problem. Mm -hmm. And we are not saying that if it were only the good old days of colonialism, it would all be better. No, we're not saying that. We're attacking colonialism because that's what the West is doing in Ghana right now. But people will think what they think, I guess. Hold on a second. This is a great transition, colonialism, and we're going to talk about Ghana now. Um, it's made the news because Ghana is introducing, I don't know if they passed it yet, but uh, stricter, tougher sodomy laws that they will never enforce. Mm -hmm. They have these laws on the books, for the longest time, pretty much unenforced. Since 1963. 1963. Uh, a lot of countries uh, had them. A lot of states here in America used to have them in 1963, and uh, I think a, a couple still do. If not, I mentioned, I think Texas still does. However, regardless, uh, Ghana is sick and tired, as most African countries are, of the continued Western colonization of their countries. Uh, it used to be we'd go in there and we'd strip out the, the rubber trees, we'd strip out the uh, oil, we'd strip out all the resources, and we would uh, uh, also kidnap people and make them uh, slaves here in the West. We don't do that anymore. We have a completely different type of colonization, and that's called gender wars. Uh, LGTP right colonialism, George. Yeah, right now we let the Chinese strip the natural resources <laughs> yeah. out from Africa, yeah. where we after three four hundred years of not caring a whit about the african natives now we want their minds and we want them to think the way we want them to think right let the chinese take the money we now want their minds 
And we've seen years of, this is very marked on the Obama administration, it's come back on the Biden administration of, you get aid if you think good thoughts, mm -hmm. if you say the right things in public. This is true uh, in Ghana. And the whole Ghana family values bill flap, which strengthens the current uh, sodomy laws taking homosexual activity from a misdemeanor to a felony from a three-year to a five-year sentence um, all has to do with Western interference in Ghanaian life and culture the EU and the Swedes and a South African lobbying group have all come into Ghana the US government uh, under the Biden administration has come into Ghana and is lobbying for gay rights and you have to adopt laws that are on transgenderism and homosexuality and allow gay marriage and all this and that that uh, are favored by the elites in the West well the elites of Ghana the chiefs council the traditional rulers put forward legislation model legislation that was picked up by some parliamentarians to say no we're not going to do this you stop telling us how to think how to believe we don't believe in the West we believe in the Bible so that's the basis of all this so we had the statement and then as we've recorded, the gay activists blew up in England. And as night follows day, Justin Welby gives his, uh, <laughs> oh, you're violating Lambeth 110. Oh, these poor people, you know, speech. Obvious Justin doesn't know the situation. He's just pandering to the left in Britain. Well, the Ghanaian press picks this all up. And the Ghanaian press has headline articles, Anglican, Anglican communion calls for gay marriage in Ghana. Church of England is gay marriage friendly. Supports um, blessings, supports, supports marriage. Supports blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Not, now that's not true. No. But they interpret Justin Welby's statements mm -hmm. in a way, in an African way, and contextualize them the way Justin Welby contextualized the Ghanaian statements in an English uh, guardian readers worldview mm -hmm. so with that that was the the first sort of two or three rounds now we have second tier figures in england chip chiming in diocese of portsmouth has some relations with ghanaian church they put out a letter condemning them the ghanaian church and the bishop of london sarah Mullally, takes to twitter parroting the jane ozan line well the uh parliamentarian pushing the uh, bill through parliament its leader it's uh hits back on sarah Mullally on twitter saying i'll start listening to you uh you know excuse me stop telling us what to do you take care of your own world as soon as you stop your priests from molesting little boys i think i'll begin to listen to you as a moral figure words to that effect so what does this mean well first of all it means and we've said this before, the Church of England is certainly the Sea of Canterbury being defunct no longer has a voice in Africa and largely around the Anglican Communion. It, you know, it, when Justin Welby tweets, nobody listens. Uh, we do because we have to talk about it. But there isn't that influence. There's no respect in the uh, Ghanaian press for this is the Archbishop of Canterbury. We should care what he you know, says about the Anglican Church in Ghana. No, they don't. Um, because I think Africa, rightfully, is just sick and tired of the the influences. And we, we you, you mentioned we saw this under Obama, of you're not going to get any money or support from the EU or from the United Nations or from America unless you uh, pass the test of our thought police. And they're sick of it. Ghana was the first African nation to achieve independence in 1960 from colonial powers. Mm -hmm. And so Ghana used to be the Gold Coast. Ghana is very, very proud of it being on the forefront of the third world, non-aligned African nationalist movement. You start telling the Ghanaians how to think so that they are at our standards of Western thought and morality that's the button you push to really set them off in a nationalist reaction. Polls in Ghana show that about 90% plus the people back this 
bill. All the religious leaders, the Catholics, the National Council of Churches, the Muslims, so on and so forth, the tribal chiefs, this has got overwhelming support. Um, and this is the issue that Justin Welby wants to bring to the forefront. And what it means is that if I were Ben Kwashi, and if I were Foley Beach, I'd be on an airplane right now to go to see Cyril Ben Smith, the Archbishop of Ghana. Yeah, well, well let's be clear, you know, Archbishop Foley Beach does not support the sodomy laws. But this is a great opportunity to go in no. and, and say, we're not here to colonize you. We are here to be brothers in Christ and, and have a, a larger Anglican communion presence, but we're not going to tell you how to make your laws. Yeah, see, this is what I think we need to make clear to mm. one or two viewers who <laughs> seem pretty thick. Most people get it, but yes, George. <laughs> what we're talking about is not the issue of sodomy. No. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is the integrity of a national worldview. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, 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 can a country be uh, autonomous? Yeah. Do you have to, to be an Anglican? Do you have to be English? Mm -hmm. That was the worldview through the colonial era, and now the Archbishop of Canterbury through the vehicle of wokeness and political correctness is returning to the old colonialist era that you're only a Christian if you give up your African distinctive nature mm -hmm. and become a little Englishman, a little guardian reader in Accra. So the, the point is at allowing uh, the space for people to work out their own cultural and moral and religious context within the the framework of the Anglican world and not saying the second and third level issues drive us and we're indifferent to the first level issues the totality you know, the integrity of scripture and the voice of God so the, the politics of uh, of western Imperialism. I sound like a, I sound like my communist daughter. You do, <laughs> but that's really what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. And the reaction—it's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, Church of Nigeria is so hard against Anglo uh, the Latin Canterbury Circle—is because of the attempts to browbeat and recolonize Nigeria intellectually and theologically. Now, remember, Ghana, under Archbishop Justice Akrofi of Accra, was one of the founders of Gafcon. When he retired, his successor, who holds the same theological beliefs, decided, well, there's something to be gained by playing along the Canterbury game. You get money, you get invited to nice conferences, you get to say platitudes about, you know, we're all brothers and unity is more important than uh, unity in for a photo is more important than unity of faith. Well, the new Archbishop Cyril Ben Smith is sort of in the Justice of Crawfee mold of saying truth is truth. We stand for the Bible and he could parrot uh, Henry and Dukaba on these lines. So when I say Foley Beach and uh, Ben Kwashi should get on an airplane to Ghana, because here you have a you have, the sales already been made yes. to join Gafcon, but the sale was made by Justin Welby, and all these all you guys have to do is get out, hand them the pen and the contract, and you've got another growing, vibrant, dynamic province, Ghana, yeah. in yeah. on your side. Indeed, um, let's get one final story here. I have, I can, I, I clicked off my show notes. Shame on me. There we go. Okay. Um, so, friend of the program, uh, person I've run into many times uh, from Pittsburgh, uh, Edith Humphrey has put out her first book. And children's book. Children's book. Yeah. It's okay. I haven't read it. You have a copy. You gave a copy to a person. And I want to uh, uh, tell the story as it may be a, a book that. Uh, we want to include in our children's collections, George. 
Edith Humphrey, friend of this show, retired professor at, at uh, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, uh, which is Presbyterian, but mm -hmm. she's now she's entered the Orthodox Church. How many Orthodox uh, people have we had on this show this today? Kept I know we keep talking about them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe Anglican slash Orthodox unscripted. Yes. Well, Edith is retired, and he's written a children's book, uh, Beyond the the White Fence. And I saw it. Uh, uh, I saw it on her Facebook page, and I thought, well, I'll be a nice guy and buy a copy. And I got it. I read the back jacket, and it looked interesting. It was a Christian sort of fantasy. Um, so it's it's a fictional a, story. A fictional story. Okay. Yeah. And. I gave it to a very precocious 12-year-old in our congregation who, who uh, uh, has the most dexterous thumbs of yeah, any say, I know. A 12-year-old now is addicted to screen time, plays games all the time, can text 60 words a minute with her thumbs. What did this person think of the book? My wife dropped it off at her home on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and I talked to her mother yesterday afternoon, and Bella, the little girl hasn't picked up her phone or tablet for two nights. Huh? But as soon as she's home from school after dinner, she's been sitting on the couch reading this book. Now, I have not read it through, but if there, it, it reminds me of the old Life cereal commercial. If Mikey likes it. <laughs> he likes it, he no, likes it. He likes it. No, so I, now I have, I have to get myself a copy. Uh, I'm gonna put a link in the show notes. Um, uh, uh, to the the book, if you want to purchase, is it on Amazon? Where where'd you get it from? I got it from Ancient Faith oh, Press. Uh, press Ancient okay. Faith Press. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just look on my Facebook page because I posted a picture of the little okay. girl with the book, and you'll see a link. But uh, I, we don't get we don't have any financial relationship with anybody on this thing. But oh. with the with the uh, cargo crisis and not being able to get plastic junk into Walmart stores by Christmas. If you want something for that uh, young preteen, early teen, uh, that they might even read yeah. and enjoy, that doesn't have this Harry sort of Potter, <laughs> Harry Potterish stuff, give this a shot. Uh, yeah. I right. mean, if Bella likes it, anybody will like it. <laughs> Any child will like Any it. Any child, yeah. Indeed. All right, so we got a whole show under the ropes here. Um, Boy, lots of t it was a lot to talk about. We really appreciate you guys hanging out uh, with us on, on Tuesdays and Fridays. Next Tuesday, you have a scheduled conflict. We may record on Wednesday if we can't get it, the show done on, on time. Well, I've got to take a parishioner to the Moffitt Cancer Center in the mm -hmm. afternoon. So if, if time allows, we'll get it done in the mor early morning. Yeah. So if Kevin and I are like, mm, oh, yes, right. we we'll film it at <laughs> 7 a.m., uh, so we'll see how see how it unfolds. Cool. Don't forget to like the program, share the program, subscribe to the program, and go to the comment section with your comments, especially about what's going on in Africa right now. Um, I think you know it, it's an important uh, story because it's being made the the Ghana story is being made worse because it's a reaction to the influences of colonialism in the West and. Yeah. You know, I, if people paid as much attention to the coup in Sudan as they do to uh, virtue signaling legislat legislation, which is designed to poke an eye in English people, not Nigerian, uh, Ghanaian minorities, the world would be a better place if they paid, paid attention to the real threats to people. Amen. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 696 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>